Hello. Hello, class. Okay, so this is, this is not actually a role play video, but it is a distinctly Christmas video with Daryl over here. Slouched, Listilla, Listilla. There is no T. S I L L A, Listilla, boots. And I can't straighten that even if I want to, but I definitely wouldn't want to. So I love these. Yeah. I know I'm excited too, Sophie. Okay, so we have the Christmas Carol. And I thought that a fun little holiday video would be to read. I guess it's like a scene of this book because it's, I think it's always kind of in a play. Let's see. I'm going to read the, I was going to pick one of the three ghosts. And of course I was drawn to the Christmas past one, but I think we're actually going to do the second of the three spirits, which is present day, which is a more jubilant ghost. We have illustrations. And this book is Silk. So, all very fancy with Daryl in the book and everything. Okay. Okay. That was kind of a weird, wordy word soup. And I don't really like that first page that much. So we're going to skip it. And Lindsay's summary is Scrooge was anxiously awaiting the second ghost coming. The ghost was late. Scrooge got even more freaked out because the ghost was late, wondering what that meant. And then light shined across his bed. And that's where we're gonna pick up. He got up softly and shuffled in his slippers to the door. The moment Scrooge's hand was on the lock, a strange voice called him by name and bade him enter. He obeyed. It was his own room. There was no doubt about that, but it had un undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove, from every part of which bright gleaming ber berries glistened. The crisp leaves of holly, mistletoe, and ivy reflected back the light as if so many little mirrors had been scattered there. And such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as that dull, <clears throat> as that dull, this word doesn't make sense here, petrification of a hearth had never known in Scrooge's time. Oh, petrification of a heart had never known in Scrooge's time, or Marley's, or for many, many a winter season gone. Heaped up on the floor to form a kind of throne were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, great joints of meat, suckling pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red hot chestnuts, cherry-cheeked apples. This is so much alliteration. Juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelfth cakes, whatever the hell that is, and seething, yeah, seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with this, with their delicious, delicious, delicious. I like that more. Delicious steam. An easy state upon the couch, 
There sat a jolly giant, glamorous to see. You know, I'm not actually reading this wrong. That's what it, it doesn't make sense. Who bore a glowing torch in the shape not unlike Plenty's horn and held it up high up to shed some light on Scrooge as he came peeking around the corner. Come in, exclaimed the ghost. Come in and know me better, man. Scrooge entered timidly and hugged his head before the spirit. He was not the dog of Scrooge he had been, and through the spirit's eyes were clear and kind, though the spirit's eyes were clear and kind, he did not like to meet them. I am the ghost of Christmas present, said the spirit. Look upon me. Scrooge rever reverently did so. It was clothed in one simple green robe or mantle bordered with white fur. This garment hung so loosely on the figure that his breast was bare as if disdaining to be warded or concealed by any artifice. artifice. His feet observable below the ample folds of the garment were also bare, and on his head it wore no other co covering than a holly wreath, sat here and there with shining icicles, and its dark brown curls were long and free, free this, I read something really wrong, free as his gentle face, a dirty mind. Its sparkling eye, its open hand, its cheery voice, its unconstrained demeanor, and its joyful air. Girdled around its middle was an antique scabbard. It's creeping me out that they keep calling this man the ghost man. It. It's... But no sword was in it and the ancient sheath was eaten up with rust. You have never seen the like of me before, exclaimed the spirit. Never, Scrooge made to answer it. Have never walked forth with the younger members of my family, meaning, for I am very young, my elder brother is born in these later years. I don't think I have, said Scrooge. I'm afraid I have not. Have you had many brothers, spirit? More than 1,800, said the ghost. A tremendous family to provide for, muttered Scrooge. The ghost of Christmas present rose. Spirit, said Scrooge submissively. Conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion and learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Scrooge did as he was told and held it fast. Holly, mistletoe, red berries, ivy, turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, meat, pigs, sausages, oysters, pies, puddings, fruit, and punch all vanished instantly. So did the room, the fire, the ruddy glow, the hour of night, and they stood in the city streets on Christmas morning where, for the weather was severe, the people made a rough but brisk and did not unpleasant kind of music. That's what it says. And scraping the snow from the pavement in front of their dwellings and from the tops of their houses, whence it was mad delight to the boys to see it come pluming down into the road below and splitting into artificial little snowstorms. The house fronts looked black enough and the windows blacker, contrasting with the smooth white sheet of snow upon the roofs and with the dirtier snow upon the ground, which last deposit had been plunged up in deep furrows by the heavy wheels of carts and wagons, furrows that crossed and recrossed each other hundreds of times where the great streets branched off and made intricate channels hard to trace and the thick yellow mud and icy water. The sky was gloomy and the shortest streets were choked up in a dingy mess, mist, half thawed, half frozen, whose heavier particles descended in a shower of sooty atoms. 
Yeah, they knew that Adam was going to build a people. As if all chimneys in Great Britain had by one constant caught fire and by and were blazing away to their dear heart's content. That was just a drawing screen. Looking angry. There was nothing very che cheerful in the climate or the town, yet there was an e air of cheerfulness <clears throat> abroad. The clearest summer air and brightest summer sun might have endeavored to diffuse in vain, for the people who were shoveling away on the housetops were jovial and full of glee, calling out to one another and now and then exchanging a facious fetish. fetish? I don't know that word. Face, tius, face, tius. Snowball, snowball in the face. Better natured missile far away than just woody, ju than just in wood, than a mini, woody, wordy jest. I swear to God, this is the hardest to read story I've ever read. But I want this one laughing heartily as if it went right and not less heartily if it went wrong. The shops were still half open and the fruiterers were radiant in their glory. There were great and round pot-bellied baskets of chestnuts, shaped like waistcoats of jolly old gentlemen lolling at the doors and tumbling out into the street with their opulence. There were ruddy, brown-faced, broad-girthed Spanish onions shining in the fatness of their own growth like sp Spanish fritters and winking from their shelves in wanton shyness at the girls as they went by and glanced demurely at the hung-up mistletoe. There were pears and apples clustered high in the blooming, pyram in blooming pyramids and there were bunches of grapes made in the shop shopkeeper's benevolence to dangle from conspicuous hooks that people's mouths might water as they passed. There were piles of filberts, mossy and brown, recalling in their fragrance ancient walks among the woods and pleasant shufflings ankle deep through withered leaves. There were Norfolk Ruffins, Braffins, Brick, this is a British word. Squat and swarthy, sitting off yellow and orange lemons, and the great compactness of their juicy persons, urgently entreating and beseeching to be carried home in paper bags and eaten after dinner. The very gold and silver fish sat forth among these choice fruits in a bowl through numbers of dull, stagnant, blooded race appeared to know that there was something going on and to a fish went gasping around and around their little world in slow, passionless excitement. The grocers, oh the grocers, nearly closed with perhaps two shutters down or one but through these gaps and glimpses. It was not alone that the scales descending on the counter made merry sound, or that the twine and roller parted company so briskly, or that the canisters were rattled up and down like juggling tricks, or even that the blended scents of tea and coffee were so grateful to the nose, or even that the raisins were so plentiful and rare the almonds were so extremely white, the sticks of cinnamon so long and straight, and the other spices so delicious, the candied fruits so caked and spotted with molten sugar as to make the coldest lookers on feel faint and subsequently billowous. Nor was it the figs were mist moist and pulpy, or that the French plums blushed in modest tartness from their highly, I feel like I'm reading this their highly decorated boxes or that everything was good to eat and it, this Christmas dress but the customers were all so hurried and so eager 
and the hopeful promise of, the, of today that they tumbled up against each other at the door, crashing their wicker baskets wildly, and it left their purchases upon the counter and came running back to fetch them and committed hundreds of the like mistakes in the best humor possible, while the grocer and his people were so frank and fresh that the polished hearts with which they fastened their aprons behind might have been their own, worn outside for general inspection and for Christmas daws to peck at if they chose. But upon the steeples called good people to all, to church and chapel and away they came, flocking through the streets in their best clothes and with their grayest faces. And at the same time, there emerged from scores of by streets, lanes, and nameless turnings, innumerable, innumerable people carrying their dinners to the baker's shops. The sight of these poor revelers appeared to interest the spirit very much, for he stood with Scrooge beside him in a baker's doorway, and taking off the covers as their bears passed, sprinkled incense on their dinners from the torch. And it was a very uncommon kind of torch, for once or twice when there were angry words between some dinner carriers who had jostled each other, he shed a few drops of water on them from it, and their good humor was restored directly, for they said it was a shame to quarrel on Christmas Day, and so it was. God love it, so it was. In time the bell ceased, and the bakers were shut up, and yet... There was a general shadowing forth of all of these dinners and the progress of their cooking and the thawed blotch of wet above each baker's oven where the pavement soaked as if its stones were cooking too it is a particular flavor in which is there a particular flavor in which you sprinkle from your torch asked scrooge there is my own. Would it apply to any dinner on this day? Asked Scrooge. To any kindly given. To a poor one most. Why to a poor one most, said Scrooge. Because it needs it most. Spirit, said the Spirit, said the Scrooge. Spirit, said Scrooge. After a moment's thought. I wonder if you, all the beings and the many world about us should desire to cramp these people's opportunities of innocent enjoyment. I, cried the spirit, you would deprive them of their means of dining every seventh day, often only the only day in which they can be said to dine at all, said Scrooge, wouldn't you? I, cried the spirit, you seek to close the places on the seventh day, said Scrooge and it comes to the same thing. I seek, exclaimed the spirit. Forgive me if I'm wrong. It had been done in your name, or at least in that of your family, said Scrooge. There are some upon this earth of yours, returned the spirit, who will lay claim to know us, and who do their deeds in passion, pride, ill will, hatred, envy, bigotry, and selflessness in our name who are strange to us and all our kin and kinneth, as if they had never lived. Remember that and change their doings on themselves, charge their doings on themselves and not us. Scrooge promised that he would, and they went on invisible as they had been before into the shrubs, shrubs, suburbs of the town it was a remarkable quality of the ghost, which Scrooge had observed at the baker's, that notwithstanding his gigantic size, he could accommodate himself, himself to any place with ease, and that he stood beneath a low roof quite as gracefully and like a supernatural creature as it was possible he could have donned in, the, in any lofty hall. And perhaps it was the pleasure of the good spirit 
had in showing off this power of his, or else it was his own kind, generous, hearty nature, and his sympathy with sympathy with all poor men that led him straight to Scrooge's clerks. clerks. For there he went and sc took Scrooge with him, holding on to his robe. And on the threshold of the door, the spirit smiled and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling with a sprinkling of his torch. Think of that. Bob had but 15 Bob a week himself. He pocketed on Saturdays but 15 copies of his Christian name, and yet the ghost of Christmas Pleasant blessed his four-roomed house. Bob Cratchit and Tiny Tim. Then up rose Mrs. Cratchit. Cratchit's wife, dressed out but poorly in a twice-turned gown, but brave in ribbons, which were cheap and make a goodly show for sixpence. And she laid the cloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second daughter, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons, while Mr. Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes and getting the corners of his monstrous shirt collar, parentheses, Bob's private property, confirmed, conferred upon his son in heir in honor of the day, in parentheses, into his mouth, rejoiced to find him so gall gallantly, that's just a hard for me to say, gallantly, attired and yearned to show his linen in the fashionable parks and now two smaller cratchits boy and girl came tearing in screaming that the outside bakers they had smelled the goose and known it for their own and basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onions these young cratchits danced about the table and exalted master peter cratchit to the skies well, he, not proud, though his collars nearly choked him, blew the fire until the slow potatoes bubbling up knocked loudly at the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. What has ever got your precious father then, said Mrs. Cratchit, and your brother Tiny Tim? That just seems like a very strange thing to call a child. Um, because it's not even Tiny Cratchit, like Tiny Bob, like... Bob. Bob will be Robert. Tim's not ro short for Robert. You know, because normally, like, if you have a kid that you name after the father, it could be, like, Junior or something. But, like, saying the tiny version of it is really just observing that he is a small, unwell child. That just seems... Anyway. I digress. Um... And Tiny Tim and Martha weren't as late last Christmas Day by half an hour. Here's Martha, mother, said a girl, appearing as she spoke. Here's Martha, mother, cried the two young Cratchits. Hurrah, there's such a goose, Martha. Why, bless your heart alive, my dear, how late you are, said Miss Cratchit, kissing her a dozen times and taking off her shawl and bonnet for her with officious zeal. We'd a deal at work to finish up last night, replied the girl, and had to clear away this morning, mother. <clears throat> My monster's over there, whatever. Well, never mind, so long as you are come, said Miss Cratchit. Sit you down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm, and have a warm. Lord bless ye. I'm going to say this is very British. Have a warm. This is why none of this makes sense to me. Okay. So Martha hid herself, and in came little Bob, the father, with at least three feet of comforter, exclusive of the fringe, hanging down before him, his threadbare clothes darned up and brushed to look seasonable. 
and Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas for Tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch, and with his limbs supported by an iron frame. Why, where's our Martha? cried Bob Cratchit, looking round. Not coming, said Mrs. Cratchit. Not coming, said Bob, with sudden with the sudden disillusion of his high spirits, for he had been Tim's blood horse all the way from church and had come home rampant. Not coming upon Christmas Day. Martha didn't like to see him disappointed, if it were only for a joke, so she came out pre prematurely from behind the closet door and ran into his arms while the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim and bore him off into the wash house that he might hear the pudding, pudding singing in the copper. How did Tiny, how did little Tim behave, said Miss Scratchit, when she had rallied Bob on his credibility, and Bob had hugged his daughter to his heart's content. Good as gold, said Bob, and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much and thinks the strangest things you've ever heard. He told me coming home that he hoped the people saw him in church because he was a cripple, I'm sorry for saying that, and might be pleasant to them to remember on Christmas day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Bob's voice was tumultuous when he, when he told them this, trembleous, trim, tumultuous, because he was trembling. okay and trembled more when he said the tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. I agree, Burkus. Oh, an awful sound. Okay. I'm not gonna do this to you. I'm gonna have to listen to the dyslexic person. Okay. I feel like that was a good sampling of me at trying to read Dickens. And So Daryl and I, are going to go, but I hope that you have a wonderful Christmas holiday season. I know that this is another difficult one, you know, lately, but It's also important to see like how different ways that we can be there for each other. I know that you guys, my friends, have been amazing this year and amazing to each other and just made this cold little heart that several years ago had kind of given up on humanity see that there are so many good people all over the world, and I'm grateful for you. And I hope that you can see that too. But, look at us getting all deep. Okay. So thank you for hanging out with me. And I will see you next time.